technical forum uh, from their uh, technical forum series. This forum is uh, about geo reinforcement and the theme of the forum is going to be reinforced soil walls. Today is 15th of September 2021. Um, it's a Wednesday here in Brisbane, Australia, uh, where I host this meeting. But well, we have um, panelists from around the world, actually from uh, five different countries, I should say. So uh, welcome to all our panelists and um, I'll introduce them uh, in a minute, but uh, also welcome all of the um, attendants to this, um, to this webinar. So hopefully it will be a very interesting forum. I'll just quickly go through the structure of the forum, um, as you've seen in our previous um, one, which was about geo barriers. Uh, we will have a quick introduction about uh, the ASICS forums, and also we go to the um, TCR, uh, which is te a Technical Committee of Reinforcement for the IGS, International Geosynthetic Society. Pietro is the head of that um, technical committee, and he will give us a quick introduction about the TCR and the activities that they do. Then we go quickly into the presentations. Um, every one of our panelists will have um, a short eight minutes presentation, uh, and the uh, main purpose of these quick presentations are that we basically set the scene and we, we talk about different items, different topics that um, we want to discuss in the Q&A section, which is uh, straight after the presentation. So we'll have a 40 minutes question and answers uh, Q&A section. All right, so let's just start with ASIC's introduction. Um, as you know, ASIC's is a chapter of, Austra uh, of uh, International Glo uh, Geosynthetic Society, IGS. So um, Australasian chapter um, basically covers Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Islands. And we are one of more than 45 chapters of IGS. Uh, and as you can see, IGS has more than 4,000 individual members, 500 student members, and 190 corporate members. So it's a global society for geosynthetics. This is the ad uh, website address for the IGS website. Uh, geosyntheticsociety.org and uh, when you become a member of this society you, you get access to the technical resources and um, all of the events and um, uh, activities that the IGS uh, normally have uh, all around the year so ASICS as I said is the Australasian chapter and here this is our website um, acigs.org is the website address and, um, and as you know, uh, we basically uh, updated our website about two or three months ago. So this is how it looks like now. So I um, encourage everyone to definitely visit our website and you will see how you can become a member of ASICS, uh, how you can um, contribute to the events that we have, also attend in, in different webinars or forums and um, in-person events that uh, we actually have throughout the year. There are also resources available on our website, uh, technical resources that you can access from the website. As one of the re resources, you will see um, recordings of uh, all of the webinars that we have been doing in the past two, two and a half years, actually. Um, this event today is actually our 24th online event since we started back in 2019. So you will see the, uh, the recordings on the website. At the end of this event, if you want to uh, obtain a, a certificate of attendance, you can email info at asics.org uh, and request that and we can organize it for you. Now I go to Pietro uh, Rimoldi. Uh, he is the TCR uh, head for the Technical Committee on Reinforcement. Um, Pietro, if you want to provide a brief introduction to the TCR and some of your activities, that would be good. Yes, thank you, uh, Siamak. Uh, I just uh, 
provide a, a short introduction to uh, IGS-TCR, so uh, IGS-TC reinforcement. Um, as you know, uh, IGS uh, is a structure with uh, some uh, TCs which uh, are uh, based on the main function of uh, uh, geosynthetics and uh, one of these functions, probably one of the oldest one, is uh, reinforcement. So, <clears throat> uh, one also one of the oldest uh, TC is uh, TC reinforcement, uh, started many uh, years ago, but uh, since uh, February this year, uh, there is a new uh, TCR uh, leadership uh, because I was the, the chair of uh, TC Hydraulics, I ended my, my terms and then the, the council uh, elected uh, me to, to, to become the, the new TCR uh, chair. And then the TCR leadership is composed by myself and then my vice chair, which is Professor Yoshisa Miata, and uh, our secretary, that is uh, Ivan Puig Damians, uh, uh, professor at the University of uh, Barcelona, who will be online uh, today. Uh, uh, so far, the TCR membership uh, is comprised uh, with uh, 65 members, so not so many uh, com uh, compared to four, more than 4,000 members of the IGS. Uh, so I will uh, invite everybody uh, who is interested in reinforcement to, uh, to become, uh, to apply to, to, to be a TCR member. The uh, IGS is launching the new uh, IGS website. It should be online uh, by the end of September. In the new IGS website, uh, all IGS members can apply for TCR directly on the website before it was required to send an email and blah, blah, blah. Now you can easily just tick a, a, a box in, the, in your profile on uh, IGS website and they will be, become a member of uh, TCR. Uh, the, the activities of the TCR with the new leadership started uh, in February uh, 2021. And since uh, then, the, the TCR leaders hold the regular online meetings to develop ideas and uh, plan activities. Uh, but then the next meeting at large of all TCR members will be organized online in the second half of November 2021. Uh, we will post uh, the, the, uh, the exact date in, uh, as soon as possible. And then we are planning to uh, publish quarterly uh, TCR news, which will be posted on the TCR page on the IGS website uh, starting in January 2022. So everybody will be uh, informed about our activities. And uh, the plan activities so far uh, are mainly to uh, organize special section in the coming uh, uh, regional and international conference. So uh, a special session at uh, Euro Geo 7, we are still trying to organize. We have already uh, organized the TCR special session at Geo Asia in uh, uh, Taipei in April 2022, which will be on uh, reinforced bridge abutments. Uh, we are uh, planning to uh, organize uh, uh, TCR workshop or special session at the International Soil Mechanics and Technical Engineering Conference in Sydney, still in Australia, May 2022. Uh, still difficult because the, the, the program is, uh, is very full, but we are trying. In any case, uh, we will also organize the first TCR workshop in 2022 or 2023, and we want this to be a physical workshop following the success of the three uh, previous uh, workshops in Munich and uh, Barcelona. And, uh, and then uh, we'll organize the TCR special session at the 12th International Conference, it will be in Roma, Italy, in September 2023, uh, and the topic will be basal reinforcement. Uh, finally, we, we, uh, all the, the uh, IGS activities, TCR will contribute to finalize the leaflets, 
organize online discussion on selected topics and prepare the IGS, IGS webinar lectures on reinforcement. We have proposed five lectures specific on uh, reinforcement. So, uh, finally, uh, TCR invite all IGS members first to apply to TCR membership directly on the IGS website. Second, attend the TCR meeting in November 2021, contribute to our activities and send ideas to the TCR leaders. Thank you for uh, uh, this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Pietro. Um... I go back to my slides. Um, so the next uh, is uh, introducing the panelists. Um, I start with uh, Richard. Uh, let me just quickly share this. Okay. So the yes. four forum panelists today. Um, Richard Bathurst, Professor Richard Bathurst um, is our first panelist. Richard, if you want to um, briefly introduce yourself for the audience, please. Yes, uh, Simak, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Bathurst. I'm a professor at the Royal Military of Canada and Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. And uh, it's only eight o'clock in the evening, so perhaps I'm the most comfortable person on the panel. Perfect. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, next is Pietro Rimoldi. Uh, Pietro, if you could just uh, introduce yourself as well, please. Uh, thank you, Sinyamak. I'm uh, Pietro Rimoldi. I'm a, a consultant in uh, civil engineering and uh, particularly obviously in uh, geosynthetics uh, and uh, I work in uh, Milano, Italy. Uh, I have been involved in uh, geosynthetics since 1986 and uh, uh, actually I'm the, uh, you said, the, the chair of the IGS uh, PC uh, on uh, reinforcement. Thank you. Perfect. Chris Lawson. You're next, Chris. Okay, uh, my name's Chris Lawson. I'm a uh, technical director for Tenkara Geosynthetics. Uh, I'm actually based in Malaysia. And unlike Richard, where he, for him it's eight o'clock at night, for me it's eight o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and I go next to Ivan. If you can introduce yourself, Ivan, please. Uh, you're on mute. Now? Yeah. So sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, I am Ivan Puig Damians. I am researcher at the International Center for Numerical Methods in Engineering here in Barcelona. Also geotechnical engineer at uh, VSL, which is a member of Wix Construction Group, and also assistant professor at the School of Civil Engineering uh, here in UPC in Barcelona with teaching activity basically regarding to soil mechanics, geotechnical engineering, and also life cycle analysis and sustainability assessment. And here it's 2 a.m. So I'm quite falling asleep now. <laughs> and you're still in your university office, are you? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I'm still here since 6 a.m. yesterday. <laughs> and with two kids, so. Thanks, thanks, Ivan. Uh, I'll go to yeah. Mike Dobby next, please. Uh, thanks very much, Sir Mike. Yes, Mike Doby. I, I work for Tensar. Um, I'm also involved in the the Indonesian chapter of IGS, where I'm the the vice president. Um, therefore, I live in Indonesia, which you'll see on the image behind me. Uh, and here it's uh, actually um, an hour earlier than Chris. I don't know Chris had a bit of a lie in this morning, and and so for me it's uh, more like seven o'clock. Thanks very much. Okay, great. Thanks very much uh, to all the panelists. Um, I'm going to start the part one of this uh, forum, which is the presentation by each of our panelists. Uh, the first one is Richard Bathurst. Uh, Richard has sent us um, a pre-recorded, uh, which I'm going to play that now. Um, <clears throat>
thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a brief presentation on probabilistic internal stability analysis and design of reinforced soil walls. Traditionally, internal stability analysis and design of reinforced soil walls has been based on yeah, uh, the sound is very low. We now have the opportunity to carry out limit states complementary prob probabilistic or is it better now? Yeah. Yeah. Reliable. Perfect. <laughs> Let's take, for example, the internal stability of reinforced soil walls, where we have a, as an example, a nominal resistance pull out <coughs> limit state and a tensile strength limit state. And the objective is to have an adequate margin of safety against the pull out capacity of any reinforcement layer being exceeded, and similarly, the allowable tensile strength of a reinforcement layer being exceeded. Now, in the classical deterministic approach, we design to ensure that the resistance capacity is greater than the load capacity. The problem is, is that there's uncertainty in the calculation of resistance and calculation of load. And these are shown by the, the red distributions in the plot. And notionally, the probability of failure is related to the overlap between those two distributions. Now, the challenge is that you can have two uh, similar cases with the same factor of safety. But because the distributions, the uncertainty in the resistance and load side can be different, the same factor of safety you can have a greater uh, probability of failure, i.e. more overlap, less safe. So the probability of failure increases as you have greater uncertainty in the magnitude of the computed nominal loads and resistances. And you have lower accuracy in the models used to calculate the load and resistance terms. And again, you can have potentially a wide range of probabilities of failure for the same nominal factor of safety assumed at time of design. Reliability-based design, RBD, allows us to compute margin of safety in terms of a probability of failure or reliability index, which is familiar to structural engineers. And this is a complementary approach to the traditional factor of safety approach or load and resistance design approach and partial factor approaches. Does it replace these methods? It's another tool. We can calculate the margin of safety in probabilistic terms for simple linear limit state equations for internal stability design of reinforced soil walls using a closed form solution amenable to Excel spreadsheet. This is the equation. It looks very scary, but it starts with an estimate of the nominal factor of safety as we would calculate in deterministic or LFD approaches. And the output is, a, is the reliability index. Now the reliability index is related to probability of failure uh, using a simple mathematical expression, but shown graphically uh, in this figure here. And you can see that as the reliability index goes up, the probability of failure goes down. Now, the uncertainty in the magnitude of the nominal load and resistance at time of design is captured statistically by quantities that are shown in the green shaded terms. The uncertainty in the accuracy of the load and resistance models that you have adopted in your design is captured by the yellow shaded terms that you see uh, in this expression. Let's look at the load side. So the question is, how do we know the accuracy of our load? Well, a large part of my life work has been collecting load measurements from instrumented reinforced soil walls by taking the measured load at a point on a reinforcement and dividing it by the calculated load, we calculate the load bias. 
a perfect model, this value would be one, but that's seldom the case. From these measurements, a large number of these measurements, then we can calculate what we call bias statistics, which give us the mean bias and the spread in the bias statistics. We do a similar thing on the resistance side. So for example, if our focus is on the pullout limit state, we can uh, quantify the statistics for our pullout model by carrying out multiple pullout tests or collecting the data from, from pullout tests in the literature. And again, we can calculate the bias values for our pullout model, where bias again is the measured value, right, the pullout capacity that we measure in the lab, divided by the predicted value based on our pullout model. So these statistical parameters are placed in this equation, which again can be put in a spreadsheet. And the margin of safety in probabilistic terms computed as reliability index. This has actually been done in practice. For example, this is an actual production wall that was heavily instrumented. And myself and my colleague, Tony Allen, asked ourselves, what are the margins of safety in probabilistic terms against tensile failure and pullout failure of the layers in this wall? And we used the equation that I showed you earlier, together with the statistical quantities that we had available to us for these limit states and did these calculations. This slide, uh, slide on the, the picture on the right shows a cross section of the wall. And the figure on the left shows the distribution of reliability index or its equivalent probability of failure in, in all of these layers with respect to depth. And you can see that the, uh, the rupture limit state uh, was always greater than one in a hundred, which is a target value in uh, probabilistic design of these systems for a highly strength redundant systems. So from a probabilistic point of view, the structure is safe and indeed it's been in performing uh, well for uh, almost 20 years. So the main points are that spreadsheet amenable equations to perform reliability-based design of internal stability limit states for MSC walls are available. We get the same answers as you would if you carried out a more tedious Monte Carlo technique and be used for any simple linear limit state equation, not just the ones I've shown you here. It's ideal for sensitivity analyses. Bias values for load and resistance models for all current and new models for geosynthetic and steel reinforced, reinforced, sorry, steel reinforced RSWs are available. It's a complementary approach to factor of safety and LRFD methods. You can detect differences in small changes in reinforcement layout and type in terms of probability that the limit state is not satisfied. And you can detect differences due to the choice of load and resistance models. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. I stop share from my End. And next up is um, Pietro Rimaldi. Um, Pietro, your eight minutes starts now. Thank you. Okay, I share my screen. Okay, I will uh, uh, talk uh, now about uh, the horizontal displacement of uh, reinforced soil wall. Uh, and uh, particularly, 
I will try to, to show that it's possible to use uh, uh, limit equilibrium methods uh, to derive the displacement of uh, uh, a reinforced soil wall. Because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, all uh, engineers are uh, uh, very much used to, to, to make calculation in ultimate limb states uh, with the factor of safety, uh, uh, partial factor, and so on. More difficult is when it comes to uh, serviceability limit states, uh, because then you are required to uh, calculate displacement and deformation, which is not so easy usually. In fact, the, the standard practice is to uh, use uh, numerical methods to, to evaluate this uh, displacement of the structure. But as we all know, uh, numerical method has some uh, limitation because uh, uh, require a lot of input data. The input data sometimes are difficult to, to find. Uh, the the uh, uh, precision, uh, accuracy of the calculation with the numerical model are uh, need to be validated uh, with a benchmark. Otherwise. Uh, 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 you, you can uh, you can make mistakes uh, double or half. So the question is: Is it possible to get the horizontal displacement or reinforced soil wall directly from the result of uh, limit equilibrium integral calculation in the serviceability limit condition? Well, I tried to answer this question and uh, I proposed uh, a, a framework for uh, this type of calculation. In fact. Uh, in uh, the International Conference in Seoul, I presented this uh, uh, displacement uh, model, which is applicable to uh, reinforced soil walls, uh, uh, either simple or complex uh, geometry, where the reinforcement type uh, are uh, primarily geogrids, but the, the, the framework, the method is applicable to any uh, reinforcement type also Woman or knitted geotextile, provided that the proper soil interaction factor for pull out is introduced. This uh, method is derived from the limit equilibrium method stability calculation, and it is important to highlight that the tensile force in the geography should be calculated in serviceability conditions. That is, by performing internal and external stability analysis below amplification reduction factor set equal to one. Uh, then this uh, uh, method is not aimed to follow the wall construction step by step. This uh, is, uh, is, is left to the numerical method. But uh, the, the, the goal here is to take pictures of the uh, wall phase deformation at the end of the construction and uh, at the end of the design life. So we can evaluate the so called post-construction displacement. Uh, so this is a, a, a Eulerian approach, not a Lagrangian approach. That means that we set the attention to what happens in a specific position, the face of the wall, at a set point in time. Then we, uh, we calculate the displacement at the end of construction, say one, three months after the, you place the first geogrid. And then at the end of the design life, and then you evaluate the difference uh, according to horizontal displacement, and you judge if the post construction displacement are uh, acceptable. How we do this? Uh, the, uh, uh, we take some fundamental assumptions. First of all, we assume that the geogrid will not pull out of the soil, since the wall is designed such that the anchorage length LA is large enough and the factor of safety for pull out is always larger than one for each geogrid layer. Therefore, each geogrid can elongate, but it cannot pull out. And since uh, uh, all stay in the geogrid will occur toward the wall face because it's the free boundary. And then we calculate the displacement from the back of the geogrid to the face. We start from the maximum tensile strength. You see here at the, at the bottom the uh, 
uh, assume distribution of tensile strength along a reinforcement. Where the failure line cut the, uh, the reinforcement, in that point, there is the uh, T max, the maximum tensile strength. And then, left of it, toward the back of the reinforcement, uh, the, uh, the tensile strength decrease according to the pull out uh, equation. And it can go to zero even before the end of the reinforcement. The same occur on the right side where the, uh, the uh, tensile strength decrease, finally it found, find the phase and then stop to decrease. So this is the, the assumed distribution of the tensile strength linearly varying from the T max to, to zero uh, on the left and to uh, T at the phase on the right. If we assume this, and uh, we assume also that the failure line is the classical uh, uh, ranking failure line, we can easily calculate the position of the T max for each reinforcement layer. This is the, uh, the formula that it can be used to, to find this, uh, this point. Then, <clears throat> using the pull out equation, uh, which is shown here, this, uh, this formula. We can easily find also the point where the uh, tensile strength go to zero. And then we define the uh, anchorage length, which is from the T max to zero. Same on the, uh, on the right side toward the face, we can calculate which is the, uh, the, um, the, the tensile strength that is left at uh, the face. And uh, in favor of safety, we can even limit it to 40% of uh, the max, but it's not uh, the most important thing. Uh, same, we can uh, calculate uh, the tensile strength in each uh, point, assuming that uh, there is a linear variation of the uh, tensile strength from the, from the max to the to zero. Now, how do uh, we uh, calculate the strain force relationship? Usually, each geogrid will strain at any point at the distance xj from the, from the phase proportionally to the tensile force in that point. That means that uh, epsilon is a function of uh, the tensile strength t. This is you, what we usually do. Now, to, to calculate the displacement, we need to reverse this law. So from the uh, isochronous curve that express the, the function, uh, the tensile strength as a function of the strain, we need to reverse uh, the, the, this curve in, uh, in the form epsilon equal function of the tensile strength. This can be done by everybody. Uh, it's just enough to plot uh, the, uh, the function t equal ft epsilon on a, uh, in Excel sheet and then reverse the axis. And then you get the, uh, the, the reverse function epsilon equal FDT, which can be easily approximated with a polynomial function. I try myself that for a, a studied geogrid, a third order polynomial is, uh, is okay. And for uh, a, uh, polyester geogrids, uh, woven or, uh, or uh, bonded, a fifth order polynomial is, uh, is suitable. I know that uh, uh, polynomial get crazy at a certain point, but if you keep the, uh, this, uh, the use of this polynomial within these limits, uh, the approximation is very good. And you can use even other functions, but uh, logarithmic exponential will not catch the double curvature of this uh, typical uh, um, isochronous service. Once we get uh, the... Sorry, Pietro, uh, we went over the eight minutes time, so uh, okay. we will definitely but, uh, get back to this in the Q&A. Very, very quickly, the, uh, the total displacement is just uh, the integral of the, uh, of the displacement in, in each uh, small segment of, uh, of the reinforcement. And last uh, but not least, we can consider also the restraint at the, at the two uh, of the structure each tier of the structure, introducing a restraint factor, Ft, which uh, will decrease 
the, uh, the uh, calculated uh, displacement in unrestrained uh, way. Uh, this is the, the simple method that everybody can, uh, can apply on an uh, Excel sheet to calculate the, the uh, displacement at the end of construction and at the end of the design life. Thank you. Thanks, Pietro. Chris Lawson is next up. Chris. And as Chris starts his presentation, I'll just remind everyone, you can use the Q&A tab to post your questions there. Just type your questions. Um, I suggest don't using the chat box because it might get lost in there, but the Q&A box is the best place you can type your questions, please. Okay, the uh, title of my presentation today is uh, Reinforced Saw Walls with Flexible Hybrid Facings. Normally when people think about uh, reinforced saw walls, they think about walls with uh, concrete facings, uh, but I'm going to give you a, a different view of this. Uh, and the photograph there in this slide uh, gives you an example of, of one of these types of walls. Now with reinforced saw walls, we can have a variety of different facings. Uh, for example, in the photograph on the left, uh, we have segmental panel facings, which are the most common type of reinforced saw wall. Uh, the face angles are near vertical, uh, have a hard surface finish of concrete. Uh, the reinforcement in the reinforced fill uh, it's normally metallic or can be geosynthetic reinforcement. And the connection between the reinforcement and the facing units is it, normally a full positive connection uh, between the two. And the aesthetics for the walls are really based on what pattern uh, you can employ uh, with the concrete uh, facings. And you can see that wall there on the left. It, it has quite a pleasing aesthetics because of the pattern on the concrete panels. Second type of uh, wall facing uh, we can have is a segmental block facing, and you can see that in the, in the middle photograph there. Um, face angles of these blocks uh, are normally between 75 and 85 degrees uh, to the horizontal, depending on the geometry of the blocks uh, you're using. Again, uh, the blocks are concrete, so you have a hard surface finish. And the reinforcements used can be either geosynthetic or metallic. And again, depending on the nature and type of the block, uh, the connection between the block and the reinforcement can either be frictional, uh, it can be full positive connection, or it may be a combination of those two. And again, the aesthetics are also based on uh, the pattern block facings. Now, the third variety, which is what I want to concentrate on briefly here, is flexible hybrid facings. And that's the photograph to the right, an example there. Uh, face angles, you can have these from 70 to 85 degrees, so almost near vertical. Uh, the angled facings uh, reduces the reinforcement loads and helps improve stability compared, say, with uh, vertical facings. Uh, as you build the wall, the facing can compress along with the compression of the reinforced fill itself. And so you always have compatibility of deformation, vertical deformation that is, between uh, the facings and the reinforced fill. Uh, depending on the type of hybrid facing, you can have a soft or a hard surface finish and we'll see some examples shortly. Uh, the reinforcement can be either geosynthetic or can be metallic. And again, the connection between the facing and the reinforcement can either be full positive or frictional connection, depending on what you have. Now, the aesthetics are commonly based on vegetated surfaces. And, and we'll talk a bit more about that shortly. 
So the varieties of uh, these flexible hybrid wall facings, generally they fall into three categories. Uh, first of all, shown on the left, you can have wraparounds with soil bags. And if you look at the diagram on the left, and you'll see what's been done here. Uh, the soil bags are filled with soil and grass seed, and these can be placed easily and geometrically, say with the back of an excavator bucket uh, to build the wall. Uh, the reinforcement is then brought out the front of the wall, wrapped around the face, and then brought back in, returned into the fill uh, to create the reinforced soil lift. And you can see an example of the photograph there uh, in the top left there. And then the vegetation then, uh, the seeds grow out of the soil bags and then grow down the face of, of the wall. Uh, the second variety you can have is with steel mesh facings. Uh, and here, of course, we have a, a, a steel mesh, which can be either vertically or can be angled back to the slope of the wall uh, faced at the facing. Uh, then behind this steel mesh normally is placed a, a geomat or erosion control geotextile. It's placed behind the, the steel mesh, as you can see there in the photograph. Uh, behind that uh, is placed a, um, a soil grass medium, so the grass can grow out of the surface. And then behind that further is the reinforced fill and the reinforcement. Uh, the connection with these, normally the reinforcement is passed into the base of the angled mesh facing, and that gives you a friction uh, connection with this sort of wall facing. And then the third category you can have is with a hard, quite a hard surface finish, and then you have gabion facings, and these of course are, are gabions filled with stone, and they can be angled back at any sort of slope, vertical, and then the reinforcement is normally passed between adjacent vertical layers of gabions uh, to create a fictional connection. Now, some advantages of these flexible hybrid retaining wall systems. First of all, they're a low cost form of construction compared to other retaining wall systems. Uh, they use maximum use of local fills as the reinforced fill and for fill works. Uh, the facings can be designed and chosen to suit local conditions and what sort of uh, facing angle you require. Uh, the, these walls are, are an earthwork solution and they're not a structural solution. So you don't have to have cranes and concrete units uh, working on site as you would in a structural solution. So it's a typical earthworks filling and compaction solution. Uh, there's no limitation on the construction height of these types of walls. Uh, they can be built very high. You can see the photograph in the bottom left there. Uh, that's very high but the retaining wall uh, used with these sorts of facings. And you can see another example there, the bottom right is a gabion faced retaining wall. And again, also uh, can be very ascetic. And normally with these other walls, uh, you can have vegetation and, and this provides a, an ascetic solution. And the other thing is about these types of walls is a low carbon footprint, uh, basically compared to other types of wall systems. I want to touch briefly on vegetated facings now for these walls, because that is normally the most common sort of facing finishing off technique used. One minute, Chris. Uh, yeah, I've, I've just got this slide to go. Oh. Uh, vegetation can be grown on facings uh, at, at steep facing angles. Can you see some of those photos there are almost close to vertical, 80, 85 degrees, and you can grow vegetation on them. Uh, you normally introduce the seeds into the soil bags to let the vegetation grow out the face of the slope, uh, choosing the right sort of vegetation. Alternatively, uh, you can hydro seed the wall facing after the wall has been constructed. Um, an example of that is shown in the bottom left there. Uh, but it's important that heavy rain doesn't occur immediately after you hydro seed because it can just wash all the hydro seeding off the face. Uh, I touched briefly the erosion control layer uh, commonly used in these facings. Uh, that can be very important, especially where 
you, the area may be subject to bushfires in dry seasons and things like this, where bushfire can actually burn and destroy all the surface vegetation. And while the root matter is left in place and can hold the facing in stable stability uh, to help, so any rainfall doesn't come along, you don't want erosion from occurring. So normally in those sorts of environments subject to bushfires, it's fairly common to use a, a geotextile layer that's actually made of glass fiber uh, that doesn't melt and by the bushfire. And for high walls, it's important to construct tiers uh, to enable control removal surface runoff. And you can see the photograph in the top left there. And you can see the horizontal tiers here uh, where the surface catchment drains has been constructed here so that any surface runoff doesn't cascade down the face of the wall, but is actually run off to the side. Thank you. I hope I've kept to my time. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, next up is Yvonne. Um, we go to your presentation, please. Yes. Uh... Chris, you'll need to stop share from your end, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, done. So can you see my presentation? Yes. Full screen, okay. So, okay, um, yeah, good morning. I'm going to present the sustainability assessment of earth retaining walls. Uh, first, I will go briefly uh, through some uh, concepts re regarding to sustainability, the sustainability concept. And also I will go a bit fast, but not to worry because I will provide some references at the end regarding the sustainability assessment for earth returning walls through a simple example or proposal that can be followed to assess uh, earth returning walls. Uh, actually, can, can be used to assess other type of structures and, and so on. So, yeah, sustainability development can be defined as an organizing principle for meeting human development goals while sustaining the ability of natural systems to continue to provide the natural resources and ecosystem services upon which the economy and society depend. So first, natural resources, economy and society are related to sustainability. Then sustainability can also define it as state of the global system encompassing the environmental, societal, and economic subsystems in which the needs of the present are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So again, we have environmental, social, and economic concepts link it or below the, the sustainability uh, concept. In civil engineering, we, we already know that several construction solutions can solve the same problem. And we, we actually, we, all, all we have uh, uh, the, the knowledge of different solutions that, that, that solve the same problem. And, and this, can be, this can be checking different type of bridges and also, for example, different type of roads with concrete or, or asphalt. And the different costs of materials, constructions and maintenance are, are, are related to one solution or, or the other one. And also the different environmental impact and social effects between the different alternatives that can, that can uh, solve the same problem. So generally the selected solution or typically up to now is usually response only to an optimum between the minimum cost and maximum function functionality. But uh, to, to, to be under the sustainability concept, this should include also economic, functional and societal, societal uh, criteria. So there is no unique way to quantify the sustainability. It can be not easy to get the optimum solution according to an objective, which uh, means neutral, reliable, trusted or realistic, uh, uh, um, an appropriate criterion. Actually, this means sustainable criterion. It is usually necessary to do some assumptions relating to value theory and multi-attribute assumptions, because we are going to compare uh, items from economic requirement, functional requirement, societal requirement, and also, of course, environmental requirement. Typically, functional and societal are, uh, are, are dealt with under the same umbrella. Eh? So typically, we have three different pillars, which are the environmental, uh, economic, and, and social. Social can include technical, functional, and so on. So we are going to, to use the MIBES methodology, which, which uh, MIBES is the acronym of Value Integrating Model for Sustainable Evaluations. You can, you can download, you can use this MIVES methodology through a tool, a, a telematic tool, 
that can be downloaded in the link you, can, you have here at the bottom of this slide. And basically, the Mythos methodology goes through five different steps, where the hierarchization, evaluation, value generation, weighting, and aggregation. I'm not going to go deep into these five steps, but I will show an example that, uh, that used this uh, five steps methodology, this, this Mythos methodology. So in this particular case study, we have a different uh, uh, retaining uh, earth solutions from gravity, cantilever, and reinforced soil. Reinforced soil with the steel and, and polymeric reinforcement. So there are two solutions for the reinforced soil. So we have to define, of course, the, the same functional unit between them, the same boundary conditions. The, all the solutions have to solve the same problem. And, and we, should, uh, we should analyze which is the optimal one in terms of sustainability. So we go through the requirements three. These requirements go from the left to the right. Uh, at, at the right, we have the MIBIS score, which is the final score for sustainability. And then we have the, the three, different three different lines from environmental, economic, and, and societal and functional pillars or requirements, okay? So from the environmental, we can complete the functional unit uh, saying that our case study, will, the time frame of our case study uh, is from cradle to operational, can, can be different, can be different, can be cradle to gate uh, or cradle to end of life. But in our case, we, we took cradle and uh, uh, up to the end of construction and that's it. And the design life of the structures, all the structure was taking us a hundred years, which is a typical design life for this kind of structures. So checking the results from the global warming potential, which is one of the, of the typical uh, indicators for the environmental, we can see that for the four different wall heights and the four different solutions, the MSC, the reinforced soil walls, uh, get the better, uh, the, the better score. If we check also the, the, the cumulative energy demand, which is another uh, uh, typical indicator to analyze the environmental uh, pillar, we, we, we get the same, almost the same. The uh, reinforced soil walls get the best solution in terms of uh, cumulative energy demand as well. So we can say that the MSC wall solution results in lower environmental impact uh, than gravity and cantilever solutions due to the use of the backfill as the principal structural component rather than the concrete and the steel. And these benefits increase markedly with increasing the wall height. Differences between the MSC wall soil reinforcement alternatives are still an otherwise polymeric in, in our case, were small enough to not be of practical significance. This is true because we were comparing uh, MSC walls against uh, 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 conventional solutions. If we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we want, if we are interested in identifying the differences between the steel and otherwise polymeric, we should do a specific analysis. So the second line is uh, for the economic. Economic is quite easy, just the, the cost of labor, construction, equipments, materials, and transports. And here you can see that up to five meters high, the, the cost uh, it's, tends to go better to the classical solutions. And for higher, for wall heights uh, higher than five meters, we can see that the cost is better for the MSC wall solutions. And the third line is uh, societal and functional uh, pillar and can be, Treat it as surveys. You, you, you can you can do surveys to get uh, the significant represent surveys to a significant representative population, both in terms of the amount of people as well as the significance of this population with regards to the problem. In this case, civil engineering students, also professions or technical professionals of the sector, and the surveys can can uh, can host questions regarding to marketing considerations, design construction, aesthetics, reliability, resilience, and so on. So at the end, we have to, uh, to, to convert these units, quantities, scores uh, obtained from the economic uh, pillar, uh, environmental, and the surveys into values. Once we have values, we can compare each uh, solution uh, or we can compare each requirement uh, up to the end. Also, well, we, we can explain this later on if, if anyone is interested, but this is, this is how we define the value functions to transform the scores into value for each pillar. In this case, the pillar, the environmental pillar and the economic pillar. And after that, we have to define the weighting for uh, each requirement. So this weighting, it's uh, typically the, the weighting of the stakeholder scenario or, or, or the taking decision scenario that we are um, to get the final score. So if we do this, we can define, for example, four different scenarios with, uh, with different weightings. Eh? Uh, in, the, in the top left, we have the same weight for each of the three pillars. So the uh, one third is for the environmental, one third for economic, and one third for the societal pillar. 
the case B, it's top right. We have more weight for the environmental. The bottom right, the bottom left is more weight for the economic, and the and the bottom right is more weight for the societal uh, uh, requirement. With doing this, we can we can get the final Mives score, the final sustainability score, and we can see that uh, even with the sensitivity of the of our uh, requirements uh, weighting, we get that almost in almost all cases the best solutions in terms of sustainability are the, uh, the reinforced soil walls. So at the end, the alternative for reinforced soil turned out to be the best choice against gravity and cantilever alternative in much most of the making decision scenarios. I, I, say, I say most because there is one scenario that we can see that the, if the economic pillar weights more, we can have some solutions that uh, the sustainability is better for the traditional solutions and not for the MSC world solutions. If cost becomes more important than social and environmental impacts, this depends on the particular stakeholder or decision-making scenario, conventional solutions may score higher for lower weight wall cases. And finally, uh, here you can have some uh, these three re representative references in where all this study uh, goes deeper. Okay, so if anyone is interested, uh, you can do a search of these uh, uh, references. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ivan. Perfect timing. Um, so we go to Mike Dolby next uh, for the last presentation of today. And then after Mike's presentation, we start the Q&A. So I can see people are typing questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you are interested to ask your question live, I can uh, switch your microphone on and you can ask the panelists uh, in the live event, but uh, please include it in, your, in the question that you want to answer it live, uh, ask the question live, and I can make that possible. Thank you, and uh, Mike. Yeah, thanks, uh, CMAC. Um, so I have the, the, the honor of the last presentation of, of this, uh, this first part of the, the forum today. I, I've chosen a topic which I, I, I feel is a kind of important one, and I don't think it's particularly well covered by design guides and codes of practice, which is, which is designing for connection strength. Uh, so here is a simple illustration of the issue. In all walls, we, we have a connection between reinforcement and facing of some form or another. I'm showing modular block, but it could be others as well. Um, so the question is, is this important? And I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, sadly, we sometimes see results like this. Uh, this, this is a, a structure which uh, ha had a poor performance, and, and that is certainly at least partly contributed to the connection technique. Uh, that's in Jakarta and, and rather more recently another one. Um, and uh, the problem is that these things can actually get into the headlines and, and, it, and, it, and it's giving these techniques a rather bad image. And, and of course, these days it also gets into social media. So we'd rather avoid this kind of thing by, by designing well for these, these situations. There is another issue. And it's a question I like to ask, and it's like this is, does it make sense that the reinforcement strength at the far end of a piece of geogrid, like you see there, is controlled by connection strength here? And I think the answer, of course, is no. Um, but this is especially the case, for example, if you're working in Australia and New Zealand where you're using AS4678 because you get an additional uncertainty factor applied to the connection uh, as well, which you don't really want to apply all the way down the geogrid. So I think it is important. So what I want to do very quickly is just to, to, to present a, an appropriate way of dealing with this particular situation, and it's going to be based on a, a two-part wedge method of calculation. So first of all, let's see what happens if we have a failure. So there is a two-part wedge on a reinforced soil um, cross-section. I think all the components are obvious, so I won't bother to describe them to you. And if it's going to fail, it's going to be something like this. And the modes of failure will be a pullout from the backfill in the middle of the, ge the geogrid, probably a rupture. Then down at the bottom there will be a pullout from the facing and also a failure through the facing. So we would like to model those in our analysis in, in a sensible way. And these things can actually happen. And there's a picture that's been shown many times. But what I'd like to do, though, is to put the wedge back uh, and, then, and then look briefly at uh, what's going on. So 
you know, to stabilize that wedge, we've got some forces, in this case from the reinforcement uh, and also from the facing. And to try to visualize a way of dealing with this, I'm going to isolate one of them, T4 there, and I'm going to make it look rather bigger. What I want to do is to develop what I call an envelope of available resistance, similar to Pietro's diagrams just now, but this is resistance. So um, if we go down at the far end, of course, there's no resistance there, but we can build up a relationship heading off in the X direction given by pull out. Uh, the, the F term there is essentially the, the frictional resistance on the surface of the geogrid, um, and, and the rest is the pull out equation. But after a certain length of or a certain distance, the pullout becomes so high that then the design strength of the geogrid, in this case, the long-term strength takes over and becomes critical. If we go down the other end, then there, there will be a connection strength there of, of some value, which is gonna be less than the geogrid strength. Um, and we can then plot a similar diagram in the X dash direction. And, and as we go in that direction, we can pick up um, uh, resistance from pullout through the the fill. So I, I refer to this particular diagram uh, as the uh, envelope of available, in this case, available factored resistance using terminology from AS4678 in this case. And the way it's going to work is very simple. Uh, if there is T4, then we read up on the diagram and we therefore develop the full design strength. But at T3, that's near the end of the geogrid. So we, we get a, a resistance from pullout. But for example, at T6, close to the facing, then our resistance comes principally from, pull, uh, from, from the connection strength with a bit of pull out through the fill. So to, to put this all together into a method, we then go back to our cross section. We have all the various forces involved in, in the static equilibrium of those two wedges, the, the self weights, the earth pressures, soil resistance and Z. Z is of course the important force we want to know the resistance to be provided to stabilize the wedge. In the case of earthquake design, especially for, for those in New Zealand, uh, we'll have some additional earth pressure and inertia forces which we can add into this system to give us a complete system of forces like this where red are static and, and blue are from the additional forces from earthquake. Uh, having established that, we do a simple calculation where we, we look at those forces and we can very easily find the force Z in that particular case. So having got our force Z, we then go and put back our various resisting forces, which we saw just now. Uh, we add them together. That's the forces in the reinforcement based on that concept of available resistance that I showed you. We add on any resistance from the facing and then for a satisfactory design, the target is that all of that resistance R should be greater than Z. It's a simple concept, of course. Um, now, good question is then, well, uh, how do we know the critical two-part wedge? Um, how do we choose it? And the answer is we, we don't know. We don't know in reinforced soil. So what we do, we simply analyze large numbers of wedges. Uh, for example, one array down there, and then we move up and we do it again and again and again. And of course, with a suitable piece of com computer software, this is very quick. Uh, so just to, to test it out with a, uh, a quick little case study, which, which I, I first saw when I went to Taiwan after the Chi Chi earthquake uh, back in 19, well, I went there in, in the year 2000, but this happened in 1999. And there were, there were three little retaining walls that got an awful lot of attention. They were quite small uh, the, and, and two failed and one was okay. And of course, that's one of the ones that failed. And, and these received a, a lot of attention from all sorts of people and, and, and a huge amount of analysis and so forth was done of these walls. Um, so if we have a closer look, you, you, can, you can see what's happened there. That what's important there is that the, the reinforced soil mass is, is stable. It's, it hasn't failed, but the, essentially the facing has come off. And, and if you look closely, this was a frictional, an almost per, a purely frictional connection. Um, and, and that was almost certainly part of the contribution to what happened. Um, so, uh, does, how, how does this work out in the technique I've just described to you? Well, uh, if we put this particular wall, that's one of the three into uh, the software, which, which can uh, analyze in this, in this way. Uh, and the way it works is quite nice because if you click on a piece of reinforcement, you see that diagram of available resistance. It's, it's, it's a very descriptive thing. Now, what's important in this analysis is that 
in the static case. So in, in this program, we can analyze static and, and, and uh, seismic at the same time. But if we look at the static results, which we see at the moment, then the important point is it's perfectly okay. So in other words, you can build that wall. It stands up perfectly all right for, un, 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 until, of course, the uh, earthquake comes along. Uh, Chi Chi was a very strong earthquake. And it also had a very high vertical component, which is another interesting discussion point, might come up later. Um, but if we, you, you can see now, we have a, have a very low connection strength there because it's frictional, even towards the bottom of the wall. But once we switch on earthquake loading, because of the various forces involved within the facing itself, in fact, our connection strength drops down to almost nothing. Um, and in the case of vertical forces downwards, everything is still okay, it, it remains stable. But if we look at the other case of vertical forces upwards, which is normally much more critical in, in reinforced or retaining walls, then we start to see lots of these red wedges. These are the ones that have an inadequate margin against failure. And in fact, the, the, the mode of failure you see in, that, in the diagram in the middle of the picture now is very much close to what happened. In, in this particular analysis, I, I used all of the the, the published information from the walls as, as was published in many published papers uh, years ago uh, in Taiwan. So it is following those directly into the analysis. And, and what's very good here, I think, is that from a simple, what you might call a static analysis, we predict very nicely what happened in, in a very dynamic situation. So, so a well-formed static analysis is, works very well for earthquakes. Um, and, and in this case, gives us a, a very nice um, prediction for that wall. It was a back analysis of that particular wall. So just to go back to my original question, uh, is connection strength actually important? And most certainly it is. Um, and the, the two-part wedge method I described to you just now uh, gives us a very nice way of using resistance efficiently along the full length of the reinforcement, which is a, a first target. Um, but on the, on the other side, it also uh, allows you to model adequately the connection strength at the point of connection. And if it is a weakness, then the method will find it out as a weakness. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we finished the presentation part of this forum. Uh, most of the speakers went actually slightly over nine to 10 minutes. So uh, let's start the um, question and answer part. I'll just share the screen. And part two, Q&A. Um, first question, how important is geogrid creep to the horizontal displacement of reinforced soil walls? Um, I'm gonna go with Pietro first, but uh, all the speakers, please, uh, if you can, uh, hold the pen up so I can see and, and come to you for a quick answer, please. That would be great. Pietro? Uh, I would say that uh, ge geogrid or uh, reinforcement creep for uh, polymeric reinforcement, obviously, <coughs> is very important for uh, horizontal displacement because the uh, short-term uh, uh, elongation occurs during construction. At the end of construction, all the reinforcement is uh, in, in uh, tension, and uh, the short term uh, uh, deformation already occurred. Then start the long term deformation, which depends basically on the on the creep properties of the of the geography I've shown in uh, in my meter. The, uh, it's all based on the uh, on the isochronous curves. So the the capacity of the uh, reinforcement uh, to resist uh, the formation under constant load, which is typical the situation post-construction. So okay. geogrip creep is very important. But uh, I have to say that uh, there is a misconception sometimes about uh, the reinforcement creep. Uh, we will see also in the probably in the in one of the uh, next uh, questions because the uh, uh, it's not really important uh, the creep of the single reinforcement 
The important thing is the post-construction displacement of the structure. So we should put limits and the, the norms should put limits on the post-construction deformation of the structure, not on the creep properties of the single reinforcement. This okay. Is for me, very important. As Thanks, Pietro. I see uh, Mike's hand is up. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Mike. Yeah, I think, I mean, Piotr is absolutely right. Um, certainly, um, the, the creep of the reinforcement is a contribution. I mean, the horizontal displacement of the wall itself is a combination of the deformation of the, of the soil mass and of the reinforcement. Um, assuming you're not getting a lot of pullout going on at the back of the reinforcement, then the reinforcement, uh, uh, if, if you can assess the distribution of the strain along the reinforcement, it's going to give you a fairly good indication of the likely overall deformation of the structure in my experience. And that, that's something that I've, I've, um, I've published about previously. And in fact, it's at the, I think there's something about it at the end of Pietro's slides, the ones he hasn't shown yet. Um, but uh, yes, it, it is an important component. And of course, the, the derivation of the isochronous curves we use comes from creep testing. Great. Um, any other comments, Richard, Chris, Ivan? Yeah, it's Richard here. I, I think it's very difficult to predict um, deformations in walls uh, due to creep in the reinforcement. There's so many factors at play, uh, including, yes, the stiffness of the reinforcement, but also the length of the mobilized tensile load in the reinforcement. You know, it, in, in Pietro's model, uh, th that uh, pullout model sort of falls apart at, uh, at deeper depths because you, you cannot generate more pullout capacity than, than tensile capacity. So trying to predict, you know, what is the mobilized length of the reinforcement is very problematic. And some of those type of calculations would lead you to believe that if you had a reinforcement layer, which is a kilometer long, you'd have an infinite amount of wall displacement. So you have to be very careful with, uh, with, with those type uh, of models in my experience. I think the, a major factor on how much a wall moves is related to quality of construction and perhaps how much the laborers drank the night before. Um, these are very complicated systems under the best of times. And they certainly are complicated uh, due to uh, you know, construction technique um, and the like. Thanks, Richard. Comments from uh, Chris or Yvonne? Uh, just a comment I have is that uh, from my experience, I've found the effect of geogrid creep uh, to be relatively small on the horizontal displacement of reinforced soil walls because I think as Richard alluded to, there are other factors going on there. It, it, first of all, it can it be affected as to how the wall is constructed and the quality of construction. Uh, it can be due to changes in behavior of the reinforced fill with time. And it can also be due to changes in behavior of the foundation conditions with time. And all of those, I think, have a, a, a more predominant effect on horizontal displacement retaining wall uh, than just the geogrid creep. So, my view, okay, it, it's kind of important we know about it, but relatively speaking, it, it's a relatively small impact. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'll move to yeah, the... One, yeah. one uh, uh, short point. Uh, uh, it's true that uh, uh, when uh, the, the, we have seen the pictures of... Uh, failed the walls and probably in uh, most of this uh, uh, of these failures were due uh, to uh, poor construction uh, poor uh, uh, quality of the fill and, and these things so but if we want to calculate displacement uh, we have to assume that the construction is properly made. So uh, the, the, we have to, to benchmark the, the, uh, our calculation against a proper construction. 
if the, the construction is not uh, is not well done, then also the insurance will uh, will come into picture or uh, other things. But uh, we must be engineer first. Design shall be uh, assumed to be correct, and construction shall be assumed to be correct. Otherwise, we cannot do any uh, calculation at all. Okay. <clears throat> uh, see, can, I, can I just ask? Um, I know it's getting on a bit this one. Yeah, but if I quickly. could just make one more quick comment, is that um, of course the uh, the main interest here is in post construction behaviour. Again, that was in Pietro's uh, presentation. Uh, what what goes on during construction is 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 that's a matter for the contractor to have properly under control. Um, so, from the point of view of the operation of the structure and the and the use by the client, it's the post construction uh, defamation. And we, I mean. Certainly in, in what we've done, we find that a, a simple two-part wedge approach, again, as I mentioned just now, gives really quite good distributions of, 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 of likely post-construction defamation along geogrid. And Richard, I mean, at the bottom of the wall, it's only the very front part of the geogrid that's going to be under load and therefore contributing. So in fact, its, it's mean strain is very, very small and, and tends to match quite well with what we actually observe from um, uh, uh, monitored walls. So thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm just keen to spend not more, more than five minutes on each question so we get to more, more and more questions. Um, next one. Uh, the code of practice, such as uh, British Standard 8006, place a long-term geogrid strain limit, creep strain limit of half a percent for bridge abutments and one percent for reinforced soil walls in general. How does the displacement method agree with this approach? when comparing the horizontal displacements calculated. Can I answer? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I repeat what I said before. For me, this, uh, uh, this limit should be uh, interpreted as uh, the formation of the structure, not a uh, creep uh, strain limit which is uh, uh, absolutely uh, uh, unuse, uh, useless. Uh, if you put a 0.5% uh, limit on the creep of the reinforcement, then as uh, uh, Richard said, the reinforcement is one kilometer long. You still get uh, one meter deformation of the structure. So the, this limit, 0.5% for bridge abutment, 1% for reinforced soil wall, it should be the allowable deformation of the structure. One percent of the height or one percent of the length of, uh, of the length of the reinforced block. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, putting a, a, a limit on the uh, on the post construction creep of the single reinforcement for me is absolutely useless. And okay. it's a big mistake, big bias in the SA006, if one interpret this uh, limit as a, a creep strain limit of the reinforcement. Thanks, Pietro. Um, Richard, do you have any comment on this? Well, I think uh, where these uh, criteria came from uh, should be reviewed because I think the way these a lot of these codes are written is they have observed that if you keep the creep strain uh, less than half a percent, for example, typically these structures behave well. And I think that that's really the genesis of these types of criteria. They, they, they shouldn't perhaps be taken literally to the point that you're trying to design for these things, if, if I'm making myself clear. And also when it comes to deformations, um, I think the best way of predicting deformations of structures is to look at empir empirical observations of the performance of good structures and look at that collected data, see where your structure fits. And I would bet that that would always be a better and more accurate prediction than any sophisticated model that you can make, including finite elements, et cetera, of which I am hugely guilty. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Mike, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, I thought just, uh, I think another comment on the, these these limits. I mean, they, they go back to a, a document published in the UK a long time ago called BE378, which was an early design guide for these structures. And, and I think some experience from one or two of the very early ones, which were load-bearing bridge apartments, indicated that, that these were limits that, I mean, as Richard mentioned there, which uh, if you kept your post construct, these are post construction strains, and and if you if you did limit them to these sorts of values, you would expect to get generally good performance. So, I mean, are they relevant today? I think if they're used correctly, they're relevant today. I, I think if they're misused, then 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 they, they would they would give you the wrong impression of what's going on. Perfect. Yeah, it's Richard here. Just make one more comment. Oh. In my experience. Uh, these structures that have behaved well, you are lucky to measure strains in the reinforcement that are greater than 1%. So if you use that as the criteria, then there's an expectation for properly built walls to behave well uh, in service. Thank you. Uh, Chris, any comments? Uh, no, sir, mate. Thank you. Um, next one, uh, I think that refers to sustainability. Might be a question for Yvonne. Uh, in what circumstances would sustainability and cost be in agreement when deciding on which retaining wall solution to use? Well, yes. Uh, uh, first, um, sustainability and cost uh, are not separate things. Eh? Cost. Um, uh, is under sustainability. Mm -hmm. So uh, sustainability includes costing, environmental, and societal. Uh, if these questions really wants to mean environmental and cost to be in agreement, uh, well, if this is a kind of, uh, of tiebreaker, uh, you have to include the societal requirement to, to, to tiebreak. But in any case, uh, in what circumstances, the circumstances, what, what really means is the in, in what stakeholder uh, or taking decision scenario you are. So it, it depends because uh, the weighting of the environmental pillar and the weighting of the uh, costing, uh, the cost pillar or the weighting of the societal can be different and can be different in terms of, I don't know, if the stakeholder is a, is a, a non-governmental organization or if the stakeholder is the client or if the stakeholder is the construction company, probably they will go more, uh, uh, or, or they will decide to weight more the cost uh, and not the environmental, but depends of the stakeholder, clearly. Yeah. Very good. Um, any other comments? Uh, I have a comment, Sam, on this. Oh. Um, normally, uh, when I get exposed to this sort of question, um, and somebody comes along and says, you know, they have a sustainable solution. Uh, normally what that means is that uh, the sustainable solution is higher cost. Um, now, I know that's not always the case and it shouldn't be the case, but it's used in a lot of situations to justify something that's higher cost. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what's Interesting here is that, uh, you know, are there any specific circumstances between sustainability and cost where low cost would agree with the high sustainability solution uh, for, for the different systems? And, and for me and myself, um, I'm not too sure where that would be. Yeah, I kind of agree on that, uh, Chris. We have um, a type of clients that um, have sustainability as their goals, maybe when they actually, you know, making their strategies for, you know, one year or five years, and um, they're happy to, to pay a premium to just tick that box in their, um, in their goals, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, you know, when you're dealing with private clients, um, that's probably not a, not a criteria for them. Yeah. Uh, next one, um, the question is about um, quantity of reinforcement. So I'll just read out the questions. How has RSW design changed with regards to the quantity of reinforcement required from old global factor of safety to the current limit state approaches? 
Any comments, Richard, on this? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. And, but it would be from the North American perspective where we went recently from the classical uh, wedge analysis approach, which we imagine as the classical um, global factor of approach to uh, a stiffness approach where we look at, we recognize that the loads and the reinforcement under operational conditions are a factor of its stiffness, not its strength. And by doing that, there have been a couple of outcomes. One is that the, the reinforcement is, is placed in the right place. The problem with the classical approaches is there's a tendency to require more reinforcement at the bottom of a structure that is under operational conditions than at the, to, at the top. And this is contrary to what we've actually measured in walls under operational conditions. The, the, the benefit of having a more accurate model, which is, for example, the new stiffness method, is that we have reduced some of the inherent conservatism in the uh, classical approach to the design of these systems. And what we found, and, and a lot of people have listened to my boring presentations in the past where I've showed that on average, folks were putting in two to three times as much reinforcement, which was, that was needed to, um, to have a stable structure. So we are saving ourselves uh, reinforcement by going to, to, to uh, new methods, but we have to be realistic and think about, well, how much does the reinforcement um, uh, play in the total cost? And uh, in some cases, uh, it may only be 10 or 20 percent. So you can argue, so what? And uh, I agree. But I think there's always an advantage of having a model which is more accurate. And finally, I can say that these more accurate models that we've now come up with can actually be calibrated uh, for use in LRFD and partial factor approaches because they're more accurate. The old methods could never be rationally calibrated uh, within a reliability framework. Thank you. Uh, Mike? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, um, just just to perhaps go back <clears throat> to um, to what we might call the traditional design methods um, on this question. I mean, I, I, I've been involved in developing a piece of the software for many, many years, which now has many methods in it. Some of them are using uh, general safety factors or, or overall global factors, and other are, are using limit state approaches, and and it just simply depends on on, on the values of the factors being used. Um, in many cases, the, the authorities or the, the, the developers of the newer, generally newer limit state approaches have, have calibrated what they're doing against the older ones. So uh, there's not necessarily a, a huge difference. So in, but if I take one example, if I were to compare one of the older global factor methods against, say, uh, Eurocode 7, actually Eurocode 7 is pretty efficient. Uh, and then if you combine that with, say, a two-part wedge method of calculation, which also has the benefit of not um, grouping lots of reinforcement at the bottom of the structure, it, it gives you a far better distribution, then, then you do get quite some benefit. But it all goes down to the factors that, that will be, have been established and, and how keen people were to, to push the limits of the design by, by, by using a, a new approach to a, a, you know, putting safety in, into the calculation. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any other comments from the panel? Uh, yeah, I have a comment, Sumak. I mean, sure. I, 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 rem I remember the old days um, of the 1980s when uh, uh, retaining walls were designed according to global factor of safety approaches. And uh, Mike referenced uh, B378, uh, and that's an example of that. Uh, then, then along came uh, BS8006, and the difference it had was that it was a, a limit state approach. And now at the time, uh, what was deemed important in BS8006, is even though it's a limit state approach, that it shouldn't be calculating quantities of reinforcement that were significantly different than the old global factor of safety methods. 
because that would create quite a bit of suspicion uh, amongst potential users, people like that, and, and authorities, and, and that was deemed important. So a calibration procedure was undertaken uh, to compare uh, limit, the limit state with the partial factors according to all global factor of safety. And, and, and coming up with the relevant partial factors gave the same answers. Now, that may not have been theoretically pure or anything, at the, uh, and, and, but at the time it, it, was, uh, it was considered expedient and, and it was considered that there wouldn't be sort of uh, a lot of questions being asked about it. And so uh, that's where it came from then in the 90s. Uh, but I think, as Richard said today, uh, times have moved on, confidence has moved on, and so it gives us the ability to do uh, these different sorts of calculations and probably what was done at the time in the transition period between global factor of safety and limit state approaches. Very good. Um, I have a question from the audience. Um, it's directed to, uh, to Richard. Uh, the question is, uh, is a weighting applied to your calculation for the different material that make up the reinforced soil structure? For example, soil has more variability than the reinforcing elements. Yeah, Sinek, I think that question is on is in your slide set if you want to show it to the rest of the people, I think. Or maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, it, it just came from one of the audience, but um, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a difficult question to, to answer without being able to point to a slide. But when we, you know, if you can remember that equation, and you must be a genius, uh, you would recognize that there were different parts. And one part was the, the calculation of certainty uh, in the nominal values for, for example, the maximum load and the reinforcement or the resistance. And when you go to do that calculation, you can actually do it uh, probabilistically if you want and, and, and weight the, uh, the unit weight of the soil appropriately and the friction angle as well. What we tend to do in North America is just to lump all of the uncertainty that we have in the choice of our parameters uh, into uh, it sort of into sort of one level of understanding and assign to our calculated maximum load, as, one, as an example, a certain amount of uncertainty that captures the uncertainty in the parameters that go into your equation. And, but also other things like the, uh, the, the experience of the designer, how many walls of, of this type have you built, this type of thing. And so this probabilistic approach also has a benefit of injecting into the calculation other important factors other than whether we think the friction angle is 35 degrees or 40 degrees. Great. Thanks. And um, now that I've got you. Um, uh, yeah, Mark, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I just uh, uh, want to add uh, one uh, important point about uh, this uh, uh, reliability uh, calculation. Uh, and uh, uh, this is. Uh, the big difference between the, <clears throat> the variability of the uh, geosynthetic reinforcement, uh, which can be 1-2%, uh, and the variability of the soil properties, which uh, with a poor uh, uh, geotechnical analysis can be even 20-30%, and with a very accurate uh, uh, geotechnical uh, analysis can be reduced to 10%, but not less. So there is a big difference between the soil and the reinforcement variability. This is the, the advantage of using uh, uh, an industrial product like a geolith or, uh, or, or geotextiles. You, by reducing the variability of the reinforcement, you reduce the overall variability of the structure. Yeah, it's Richard here. I'd just like to say something in favor of the soil. One, one thing that has made this type of reliability analysis uh, relatively easy to do is that in most walls uh, with good soils, the soil itself is placed and compacted to a tight specification. 
And so the variability in the, uh, the unit weight and the friction act angle of the soil is actually quite low. You know, folks have gone in and, and, and actually tested the materials. And in some cases, that variability is approaching the, the variability that we would expect in other engineered materials, such as our geosynthetic reinforcement materials. Thank you. you know, so, most, people yeah. think of, most people think of variability in soil, natural soils. Now that's a different mm -hmm. animal. But when you have an engineered soil, uh, the variability is typically uh, much lower. Particularly if you have a, you know, if you're compacting to 90 to 95% of modified proctor, there's not going to be a whole lot of variability in your soil, in the reinforced soil zone. Great. Just for the um, audience, um, just a note for them. Um, so we will be probably finishing in about four minutes uh, if, if you're um, keen to know how long we're actually going to go. Um, there was a, a, a comment from Chris. I think you wanted to make a comment on this one. Yeah. Uh, just going on from what Richard was just saying about the reinforced fill and the quality, uh, there was quite an extensive research program carried out in the UK. This is some 20, 25 years ago now, where um, the, the transport authority there went around all the re a lot of the reinforced soil wall sites in the UK and, and measured the in situ uh, peak friction angles of the compacted reinforced fill on the site. And, and typically what they found is the peak friction angle of those fills was around 55 degrees. Now, I question, if you're the designer, how many of you designers would assume a 55 degree friction angle for your reinforced fill and your wall design? I, I think you could probably count them on less than one finger. Mm. But in actual fact, in site, in situ, uh, that's the result of sound. So that gives a whole different level of safety and stability, deformation, everything, uh, when you actually go to the sites and actually measure the types of friction angles that you're achieving. Yeah, good comment. Thanks. Yeah, Richard, I just want to say, Chris, yep. that's one of the reasons why these walls are so safe. Yep, that's right. That's right. Because they're being forced by code writers to assume that no matter what the what the soil, it has a friction angle of 35 degrees. But if you take that same soil and you test it in the lab in plain strain conditions, you can get 55 degrees easy. Yeah, yeah that's correct. <laughs> Uh, Richard, this one is also somehow related to your um, presentation. Um, question actually came to us from a practicing engineer, a designer. Uh, the question is, I find it difficult to apply this in my own design, say with BS8006 uh, or AS4678. Is there a mechanism in plan uh, or some future work to allow for the adaption of this analysis technique to pre-existing design methodologies? I think most of it is due to uh, my inability to explain clearly what I'm proposing. What I'm proposing, you still carry out your design as you would using BS8006 or the Aussie standard. And that gives you a nominal factor of safety. But then what we do, we include around that nominal factor of safety, the uncertainties that are associated with our estimate of the nominal load and nominal resistance and the accuracy of the models that you used to make your design. Those are the things that we're sort of adding on top of what people are currently doing. So it's not an either or thing, okay? It's a complementary approach. Um, so I, I'm not sure what I have to do in the future um, to, um, you know, make it clearer. <laughs> maybe folks will have to read that, our papers a little more closely, or maybe even they have to call me on the phone. Sure. Oh. Perfect. Um, thanks. Uh, we had more questions, but uh, I don't have time. So um, thanks again for the, um, like all of our aud audience who uh, uh, will be, we're, we're listening to us or watching us today. 
thanks, special thanks to the panel. Um, you know, we had the panel from five different countries, including myself, six different countries. Um, so Chris Lawson from Malaysia with us today, uh, Mike Dobby from uh, Indonesia today, and uh, Pietro Rimaldi from Milano, Italy with us today. Um, Richard Bathers from uh, Canada. Thank you, Richard. And uh, Ivan Damiens from uh, Barcelona uh, with us. And um, I understand having uh, a, a panel from six different countries in different time zones. Uh, we had uh, late nights uh, in Canada and, and very early morning uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, it's not a bad time here in, in Australia. And I think um, you know, early morning for, for uh, Mike as well and Chris. Um, thanks again. It, it, it's not, uh, you know, an easy job or easy task to pull together the contents, the speakers, the, the, the um, topics even. Um, but I think it was a very interesting uh, forum. We had a very good conversations, uh, conversation around each of those topics. And um, I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed it. And um, as Essex, we doing we do two forums every year. So we have a March forum and a September forum. So uh, stick with us next year, 2022. We will have uh, TC Hydraulics, and uh, the other one is is TC uh, Stabilizations that uh, we will have in 2022. Also, our monthly webinar program in 2022 will be on. Uh, we'll have uh, eight webinars uh, February uh, until until November. We also have normally in January and December uh, we have um, some uh, uh, topics re relevant, not technical, but relevant to geosynthetics. We had one on ethics uh, last year. We have another one sustainability coming up in December. So um, thank you again, and uh, I finish with um, encouraging again everyone to visit our website. Um, our new membership campaign for 2022 starts from 1st of October. So if you are not a member of ASIC yet, um, I encourage you to join us as a member. Uh, we have almost 1400 subscribers, but maybe 10% of them are actually the, the, the members um, of the society. So I think there's huge potential for the society in Australasia. Um, join us and uh, we can deliver uh, better events and um, yeah I finish with that thanks again uh, to the panel and to all of our audience we'll see you in our next event see ya bye yep. bye bye thank you nice to see you guys thank you yep. <laughs> bye bye everybody